We talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Wanna take me cruising on an ocean liner to places I long to see? Well, with my champagne taste and your beer bottle pocket, don't forget to write me when you get there in your rowboat, when you paddle across the sea without me. Do you see us dining on caviar and pheasant With descendants of royalty Well, with my champagne taste in your beer bottle pocket I'll be having pheasant while you're dining with the peasants Dunking donuts in a diner without me You said you have ambition To make my dream come true Well, brother, you just keep right on wishing And all of my dreams will come true Without you (laughs) Do you see me in a Jaguar With all the accessories And one of those accessories is you (laughs) Well, with my champagne taste And your beer bottle pocket Take back your Jaguar, accessories, etc., and drive back into your dreamland without me. <laughs> and if I wanted diamonds, you'd offer me breakfast at Tiffany's and luncheon at Cartier's, you'd recommend. Well, with my champagne taste and your beer bottle pocket, you will have to work on something better than a zircon because your diamonds are this girl's worst friend. <laughs> you said you'd promise me anything to make my life a feast. You didn't give me anything. Not even our page, you beast. And it wouldn't surprise me if a lady like a diver had someone like you to give her the stall. For with her champagne taste and your beer bottle pocket, when she couldn't get those dresses, she just let down all her dresses and forgot she was a lady after all. <laughs> So if you want me to be a part of your permanent employ, before my champagne fizzles, come up with a real McCoy. Show me you can separate the man from the boy. And bring me a constant life of champagne taste. All right, here we go. Snacky tunes. I, s- welcome, Terry what? Diabolic. What was that pause? Uh, I'm having trouble hearing stuff in my uh, headphones. Can you hear me? I can hear you because you're sitting next to me. All right, fair enough. Uh, welcome to Snacky Tunes on this uh, crisp fall winter day. Not fall, crisp winter day. Uh, we have a great show today. Actually, this is one of the shows I've been more excited about. Um, we are going. We are joined by Jordana Rothman today. Hi. Hi. Of Time Out New York, who has been on the show before. That's right. With uh, Pat Lafrida, no, or the what was Mark Pestor from Pat Lafrida. And uh, we uh, wanted to, we wanted to uh, bring Jordana in, to in order to talk about. Oh, there, there I am. Headphones. Hey, there we go. Uh, we want to bring Jordana in to talk about. Um, 
you know, what had happened in 2009 is food trends and then looking to the past and looking to the future, which is always interesting to see what predictions were made and what came true and then to, again, predict what might happen. Uh, and, you know, Jordana has been a great resource to us for last year and she is an excellent food writer. And so, Jordana, welcome officially. Thank you so much. And this will be a uh, podcast and archive, so we can even see... A year from now. Oh God, you're gonna hold me to my. We're gonna hold you. You know what? Let's let's say it right now. We're bringing you back next year. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. and we're gonna hold you to it. So this is the first annual. I gotta change everything I was. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, people will continue to eat food <laughs> and yeah. drink. Yeah, that's, my prediction. that's all I'm yeah, saying. That's it. Yeah, because this list was mostly just wish fulfillment. So that's fine. I mean, I mean, what's the point of uh, making predictions if you're not gonna dream big? Exactly. So, well, exactly. So, I like that, that but, process. Before we get to the uh, the future, let's uh. Let's take a year back. We need like a wind chime. Like, let's go back <laughs> to so 2009. Last, yeah, last year, as everyone knows, the uh, economy dumped and hit the fan in a shit sort of way That's at the right. same time. And uh, I would say that while the restaurant industry is fickle, uh, it was disastrous last year for so many people. I mean, I think there was a time back in like March and April where it was just left and right. It was just closing. Anyone who was on the edge or in a margin shut down. That's right. You know, I think a lot of people will tell you that 2009 was sort of a depressing year in food. And I think to a certain extent, that's correct. I mean, we lost some of our most beloved restaurants. We lost Chanterelle, which is a, just a huge blow for the fine dining community. Fleur de Sel, I mean, like you said, I mean, any restaurant that was sort of teetering on the edge is just lost to history at this point. So, And, you know, fine dining just took a gigantic blow. And that's sort of a sad thing in a, in a city that has supported that culture for so long. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of exciting. It was kind of cool to see the way that the high-end chefs were able to sort of adapt to the economy and just tweak the experience of dining in their restaurants so that it's affordable and accessible to like a wider range of wallets, which was really the key of 2009, I think. So sad, but also kind of uh, exciting. So what were some of the uh, restaurants that you saw that really tweaked and, and helped out? Yeah, um, well, I think... Th- value across the board was something of interest to all of the restaurants, whether they were extremely high end in the manner of like Tom Colicchio at Kraft. He introduced uh, price fix menus like uh, he did something called Frugal Fridays. It was very popular. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even Jean Georges had a restaurant called Matsugan, very elegant Japanese restaurant in Tribeca. He did like a thirty five dollar fixed menu, which was very popular and and really delicious. And I mean, this is Jean Georges. I mean, he has a history of you know, doing things that are accessible, but I think to really downscale such a beautiful restaurant is kind of a game changer. Um, and then Danielle Boulou, I mean, Danielle Boulou opened a sausage restaurant in the East Village, and that's like, that's a turning point, man. We ate there. Yeah. Yeah, you like it? Uh, yeah, it was good. I mean, I didn't like, I didn't like all the sausages. Yeah. But I mean, I, we had a great meal there. It was actually with pa- Patrick from Heritage. Oh, yeah. So he took us there. And I was like, this is fantastic. Also, the it's like DBGB, which is our initials. So, what's <laughs> oh, to hate? Personal connection. personal attachment. But yeah. I think uh, as a as a diner, especially yeah. something like that, it uh, it made me think about what I was ordering more mm-hmm. and like what value was in a way where I go, oh, I'm here. It's going to cost X amount, and I'm just expected to pay. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I'm walking into the Sirsta restaurant, so that's like two hundred bucks right there. And then I was like, well, what am I actually getting? Right. And I think that there was sort of more collaboration between the diner and the chef this past year of just That's like, interesting. of just like, what are we getting? Cause we're going to, you know, we got to go out and eat, but yeah. like, how are you bringing us in? Well, and I think that speaks to the value argument again. I mean, from, I feel like everyone says this every year, but the comfort food invasion, I mean, right. this year it was like a banner year for comfort food from fried chicken, which was in every kitchen from Momofuku to La Conda Verde. And really high-end, beautiful pizzas, Neapolitan pizzas at Caste and Motorino and Roberta's. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Roberta's. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Roberta's. Um, but, you know, the idea of, again, just value in, in your food. Th- though I will say that there are restaurants that opened in 2009 that were fine dining restaurants that I think sort of paved the way for restaurateurs in 2010 to step in and still create places that are expensive and serious restaurants like Morea, I think, is a great example of that. You know, Morea is, is Michael White's pasta and seafood restaurant on Central Park. It's beautiful. It's expensive. It's serious. But it thrived. It's been packed since it opened. So, you know, I think that there's there's a scale. And I do think that places like Morea will continue to open as the recession starts to rebound. And, 
you know, saying that, is that a New York sort of only like trend bucker? Because I know that New York is a, is a very tough place to judge the mm-hmm. economy as a whole because it's a city of the world and mm-hmm. you have so much money coming in from other places in the world that have nothing to do that are, uh, with the like, American economy. So you have a place like Corton, it's like a four-star restaurant that opens up um, and you can have people, international people coming in whose money's doing much better than the dollar and mm-hmm. support that. Um, did you find that, you know, across the board that this was true for the American dining scene or like was New York and like L.A. and like the big yeah. cities the only ones that could really open up those these major restaurants? You know, I'm a I'm a provincial gal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a New York gal, so I, I can't speak to the, the country at large. But I would say um, from my provincial uh, Brooklyn Knights standpoint that. New York does support this kind of economy more so than anywhere else, whether it's a recession or otherwise. I think that, um, you know, New York, L.A., San Francisco, um, a few other cities that don't necessarily warrant mention, (laughs) um, they just they support a dining culture. And there are people that even uh, if they're scrimping and saving are willing to go out and and spend money. It's an escape. It's an escape. Um, Yeah. So you mentioned Roberta's, but mm-hmm. Roberta's also kind of thinks, speaks larger to the growth of Brooklyn, or the, even more than growth, just the cementing of Brooklyn as a, as a culinary place. Mm-hmm. I mean, we exist here, we shoot the show here, Sam lives here, but I mean, I, you know, it's been, it's changed, there's more and more restaurants, especially around where we live, that yeah. we can just go to eat that's um, just, if not on par, but better food, cheaper, because it's in Brooklyn, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that explosion. Yeah, I think 2009 just solidified Brooklyn as the epicenter of enlightened eating in New York. I mean, there's nowhere else in New York where there are as many people who are invested in what they're eating in where what they're eating is coming from as Brooklyn. It's really amazing the community that's developed and really solidified in 2009. Um, I'm a South Brooklyn gal, you know, but I do want to give a particular shout out to Williamsburg because I think that of all the areas, it's just, it's, it's on fire here. I mean, people, the Roberta's is sort of like a clubhouse for this sort of thing. And I think there's so many restaurants that have popped up to suit this, this new kind of enlightened dining public in this area. So it's, it's very exciting. And of course, all the supper clubs, which we haven't even talked about, but I think that sort of a lot is radiating out from this area. I think, uh, one of the Franks from Frankie's is yeah. doing a supper club, and they were also just highlighted in Food and Wine this yeah. month, which is just to open the page and to see just, I mean, that's Brooklyn yeah. front and center. And, if, you know, those, I mean, them and, like, Prime Meats is just sort of really <laughs> just y- what you couldn't ask for a better meal anywhere in the city mm-hmm. of just, you know, anything from just pizza to, like, steaks and seafood and just vegetables. Mm-hmm. And that's all in our back door, which, you know, I, you know, Four five years ago, mm-hmm. if you're going out, you're when we going first out moved here, it was mostly like Puerto Rican, Spanish places on Chinese yeah. food Chinese and food. Asian food, and, and just like over where I live, just Italian, just Italian restaurants, old like Italian clubhouses and things. But yeah, the the Franks are a great example of this, and I mean the Franks have had some credibility for the last few years with Frankie's four five seven, and you know they've been they've been doing well. I mean they're not just bursting onto the scene or anything, but this was a huge year for them. You mentioned prime meats. That was a gigantic critical success. I live in that area and we're talking like hour and a half waits. I go there in the morning and it's like a bustling breakfast clubhouse. And then even down the street, like buttermilk channel, another great restaurant, two hour waits on Friday nights. It's really unprecedented in in this borough and people are coming from Manhattan to come eat here. And and why not? I mean, this is the center of things in terms of food. And I I think it's, you know, and because we're more involved in the Brooklyn food community but it really is a community i get more of a feeling of mm-hmm. we're you know we're in this together uh, and we'll see if that feeling lasts once you know it becomes cemented and someone goes well i don't need i don't need you because now that like brooklyn's on the map um we don't need to like help each other out but i feel more than the manhattan feel mm-hmm. it is a clubhouse out here it is mm-hmm. like this is what we're doing together i don't know I don't know what form it will take when it reaches Manhattan. I don't I don't know that it will have the same mood as it has in Brooklyn because you're right. In Brooklyn it's it's friendly. It's like these are people that you know, these are people that you see and you break bread with. You know, but in Manhattan there's more of a there's more of a sprawl. There's the communities are not as are much more diverse. So I don't know I don't know what form it'll take, but I would love to be able to to see a crossover and be able to kind of create a food community citywide that we can participate in. Uh, and, you know, speaking of different areas that have grown, it, you know, you, we had spoken about before, it's not just Brooklyn that's kind of solidified, but you t- 
touched on uh, the slow return of the meatpacking district. Oh, right. Uh, which <laughs> I, which is funny because I I mean if I could you know I tried to go eat there a couple a couple months ago a few months ago and I was like. I just can't even begin to think about where to touch on. So it's like eating in a disco. Yeah, it really is. But <laughs> but so I, I, would like to, I would love to yes. hear your thoughts as as a rise because when you say rise, it means you were there before and then you left and now you're willing to go back. I'm gonna tell you this. Okay. I am. I'm not gonna be the champion of the meatpacking district 100. percent I'm not. This is not a place that I flock to necessarily. But as a writer and as somebody who tracks openings and is deeply involved with the goings on in the restaurant scene, I've definitely seen movement in that area that previously just didn't exist. I mean, even Scarpetta, which is sort of like cuspy. I think it opened maybe the end of 2008, but really got traction in 2009. That, again, is a serious restaurant with an excellent, talented chef. That is not a place that, you know, the ladies in their stilettos, like, cackle into before they go out to whatever club that I can't even conjure the name of because I live in Brooklyn. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But, and then the Standard Grill, I don't know if you guys have had a chance Mm -hmm. to get out there, but I really like that restaurant. It's simple. It's, it's, you know... A welcoming place for for folks like us and for that matter all of the concessions in that hotel the standard hotel are excellent there's a beer garden with sausages from kurt gunterbrenner that's that's credibility that's right. those are names that you want to visit a lot of people have been excited about bill's barn burger i've yet to be fully inculcated into that but i think it's still of note and it's bringing new diners who are interested in, in what they're putting in their bodies and in, into the area so that's that's good movement Sweet. it's the meatpacking district that's the meatpacking district all right, so we are going to play a short song, take a, a bit of a, a breath, and then we're going to come back with uh, Jordana and talk about 2010, the future, 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 future. And then later on the show, we have a uh, wonderful call-in from one of our favorite bands, Yacht, who put together a special mini-mix uh, for us. So you're listening to Snacky Tunes. Big shout-out to Robertus, who is our sponsor today for the pizza, and Whole Foods, who's also one our sponsor today. Uh, go visit them. We will be there actually picking up dinner tonight after the show. Big shout out to Jack Inslee and Rectech for making us sound good. And Terry, take it away. You're listening to Snacky Tunes uh, with your host Finger on the Pulse. Today we have Jordana Rothman from Time Out New York talking to us about the past and present uh, food trends Hello in Brooklyn again. and New York City. Hello. Uh, so we're in East Coast City. Mm-hmm. You're a Brooklyn girl. Mm-hmm. But you smell an invasion <laughs> uh, on the horizon of 2010. That's right. And it's not from across the pond. It's just from across the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is actually something I'm very excited about, um, this West Coast invasion. Uh, we've already seen uh, some sort of opening rifts 
of this San Francisco, L.A. presence here with places like Northern, Northern Spy Food Company, which was opened by two veterans of a restaurant in San Francisco called A16, uh, and also Dos Toros Taqueria, which I think is totally undersung and delicious from two guys from Berkeley. Wait a second. Are we talking California-style tacos in New York City? Mm-hmm. Okay. On Fourth Avenue. I'm going to say that this Uh-oh. is the first time I'm hearing about this, and you know how I feel about Mexican food. Get so on it, I'm a Dad. little disappointed. <laughs> I think it's been open for a few months, so I'm going to say a little behind the times. A little, I've been a little. Got to get out there. Yeah, I got to get out. Not there. really finger on the pulse. <laughs> get that finger back on the pulse. But yeah, uh, so California invasion. So California invasion. Well, so you know, I think there's already this kind of strong kinship between California cooking and you know specifically San Francisco cooking and, and really Brooklyn. I think that was really explicitly stated a few months ago. There was a supper club series here in Brooklyn. It was like in an Airstream trailer, I think, behind diner maybe. And there was you know it was a collaboration between San Francisco chefs and Brooklyn chefs. And I think the idea of there being this kinship, this stylistic kinship between the two, was really the the meat and the the philosophy behind that dinner um and 2010 is going to be big it's going to get real i think i think everyone feels a way about 2010 in general i think everyone feels an upswing well have you heard the name nate appleman no this is new okay well nate appleman was a chef of a 16 in san francisco he's collaborating with keith mcnally uh to do a pizzeria which is sort of catty corner to whole foods bowery which is our our sponsor today Mm -hmm. um and (laughs) <laughs> there's been uh, there's been a lot of chatter about this place. The pre-opening buzz is ridiculous. Like, I think uh, Nate tweeted a photo of some pizza the other day, and people just went, you know, like off the rails. I'm so gonna, excited about it. I'm going to say that a 2009 trend was that pizza really exploded. Mm-hmm. Do you think that New York needs another high-end pizzeria? You know, it's a good question. It's a good question. And, and I think typically I would probably say jump the shark. But we're talking about Keith McNally and we're talking about Nate Appleman. This guy's a very talented chef and very, like a lot of uh, L.A. Cred- uh, California credentials. I think he won a James Beard Award or he was up for a James Beard Award. So, I, I mean, it's pretty exciting. Keith McNally, his concepts are incredibly tight. So I, I, I think we'll probably have a winner on our hands. All right. I'm just, you know, yeah. with Co and... All those places just... They, I'm not saying you, you can't get to a point where everything's mm-hmm. been done with pizza, but, you know... I think you can get to that point, I think, actually. I mean, I, mean, I think we're at the point. I, I, look, I, I'm only not saying that because of, you know, we're sitting in Roberta's, whose pizza I love. You know, yeah. I've, I've been to Marino. You know, I've done the whole pizza thing. And, um, you know, uh, what's it? Matzo, Mario Vitale's place. Yeah. And just, like, it gets to a point where it's like, okay, pizza... Mm-hmm. Like, well, like, I, like high end ingredients, homemade sausage, mm-hmm. and you know, again, this plays back to um, your idea of comfort food. But you know, is comfort food going to reach a saturating point for 2010? Is there a point where I've had all the fried chicken, I've had all the falafel, I've had hot dogs? Like, like well, you know, the, you're you're you touch on a on a very salient point, which is that the pendulum is always swinging. You know, we've we've hit comfort food, you know. Uh, saturation point before and we've gone back to fine dining. I mean, I think that there is this this possibility for fine dining to make something of a comeback in 2010 and in, and in the years hence, which is sort of what we talked about earlier with Maria kind of paving the way. Jonathan Benno from Per Se was the executive chef there and he's going to be opening a new project. Um, I don't know too many details about it yet, but it'll be very exciting. Obviously, very talented chef and it will be high end, you know, so I think I think you're right. I think that there is this is sort of clearing the way for people to want to the grandeur of dining out again, right? You don't just want pizza and no, beer. No, you don't. Ben, speaking of pendulum swinging, you know, what are your thoughts on the rise of cocktails in, in the 2000s? I mean, it really went yeah. from, there was an article in the New York Times this past weekend about mm-hmm. how we entered in with like the sugary vodka drinks. Mm-hmm. And then obviously we've seen just the huge explosion of this and, you know, uh, going from just, you know, drinking whatever to secret clubs and passwords to, yeah. you know, your best friend knowing, you know, how to make a perfect, you know, old fashioned, mm-hmm. from like an 1880s recipe. Right. Well, we were talking about this a little earlier, Greg and I, and I, I think that uh, if you've read my work or, or read Time Out recently, you know that I am a huge proponent of the cocktail movement. I, I really support what's been going on there and cocktails as sort of a slow food, almost development. Um, at the same time, I 
am sort of tired of having my cocktails and speakeasies. <laughs> I want to be able to have a good drink and not need like a secret handshake to do it. You know, so I think that's something that we could see in 2010 where the cocktail movement is going to sort of take a deep breath and calm down a little bit. And we're going to be able to have bars that are really focusing on techniques and ingredients and not so much kind of the, you know, their the straightness of their bow ties and, you know, the rattle of their of their phonographs or or whatnot. And I think I have to agree with you. I, I won't say where, but a few weeks ago, I was out at one of the more respected mm-hmm. cocktail places and one of, they infused their own uh, spirits. And I just wanted the infused spirit. I didn't want to deal with the whole cocktail. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was like, you make it on your own. I just want this neat. And they took a little offense. Yeah. And I was like, look, like this is like, it was the first time where I'd been one of those bars. I was like, look, I'm coming here to drink what I want. Mm-hmm. And while I will order as many cocktails as I can fit down my throat right <laughs> now, I just want something very simple, very clean. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Maybe, maybe I don't want a whole meal. Well, like you know what? That's that's the problem. I think that I think that's one of my problems with this sort of speakeasy thing is that I don't want it to be intimidating. I don't want it to be intimidating to drinkers who might otherwise just go to some dive in the East Village and order a vodka tonic and call it a night. I want people to be able to have the experience of serious cocktails made with tasty, delicious artisanal products and fresh juices, and not feel like they're uncool if they don't know what's in a Martinez. You know, so I think that I think that makes a good point. And also, um, if you want to actually have a good cocktail in an interesting spot, I would recommend the Randolph on Broom. I've been really into this place lately. You've been telling me about it, but I've yeah. yet to go. Yeah, I I don't know. This is sort of touching upon what I'm talking about. It it opened, I think, in late 2008, but it's gained traction this year. It's like a dive bar for all intents and purposes, but they do a good cocktail, and that's what I want. I just want I I want to be comfortable and well lubricated one question pricing on cocktails Mm -hmm. because i know they can get upwards of 15 dollars, things like that Mm -hmm. what do you think an appropriate well done type of cocktail like this should cost well i would say around 12 or 13 dollars i think i know it's expensive but here's the thing that you have to keep in mind you are not drinking you know your watered down two two ingredient highball when you're drinking these cocktails they're potent they're dangerous you know they're they are (laughs) they're really they're really intense it's all liquor and you don't have eight of them you have right you know three or four three or four of them instead of drinking eight singles you drink three or four doubles or triples right you know you you have to have a little bit more self-control with these cocktails and that's actually you know People that are not, that are not used to drinking like that are in for kind of a trip the first time they go. Right, they we go have drink. a lot of friends yeah. like this. You're yeah. also um, what I found interesting when we were talking about before. You're making uh, you're betting kind of the the money on the, the rise of tiki. Tiki, yes. which is which <laughs> kind of struck me because to me when I think tiki, I just think like kind of cheesy, like yeah. But well, that's that's the effect but, but of age, you know. Tiki had a huge moment in the '50s and '60s. It was like it was incredibly popular, and yes, it is kitschy and it is playful. But listen. Like Trader Vic's, I don't know if you're familiar. Like there is a lot of fun, whimsical food and drink that came out of that trend, and it was bastardized with the addition of like super lots of sugar and pre-made mixes and things like that. But when you make a kitschy tiki drink with aged rum and fresh juices and real responsible products, it's delicious and it's fun and playful. And I think that that sort of plays into what we're talking about. That I want. Cock- the cocktail movement to get a little bit less serious and I see it happening and there's two places that are actually opening this year that I think will speak to that trend. The Hurricane Club which is on Park Avenue and that's... <laughs> it, I mean, it, Hurricane Hurricane Oh like, my god, I want a highbrow hurricane so bad. Like, like that be good? Bourbon Street Hurricane? Yeah. No, but you know, yeah, high end. High end. But this is actually Maybe operated... Like half this one. is a restaurant. <laughs> this is a restaurant. Of course, I'm sure they'll do cocktails as well but it's from the, the gang behind Park Avenue Winter this is a great really? restaurant. Yeah, a great huh. restaurant. Craig Koketsu, talented chef, really good looking. Um, <laughs> like your eyes went a little dreamy right there. <laughs> Stop. Um, and then, of course, uh, Richard Boccato from Dutch Kills is also opening sort of a Polynesia-themed bar. I think it's, it's called The Painkiller, uh, and that's going to be in the old East Side Company space. So that's also going to kind of oh. be a tiki theme. I think people are going to love it. But didn't, did, a, didn't the Rusty Knot last year, if I remember, didn't they do like some like blended drinks? And that was sort of like a bit like we have three blenders on hand. For yeah, it. you know what? You're right. They did do it there. And actually, the bartender behind those drinks is Toby Maloney, um, a very well-known bartender in Chicago and a very talented guy. But. I don't know. I don't know why that. Did. I mean, it was. You know what? That was a really popular bar. So I maybe mean, it did. It was take a popular off, bar, and you know? it took off. Um, speaking of names, mm-hmm. what names are we looking for? Because you just read off a few names. Ooh. But a lot, and 2010, 
there's you know there's the chefs right but then there's also like the bartenders the restaurant tours the moguls the moguls from the, the house the dynasties right well in, t- in 2009 it was all about michael bow opening like a baguette and on every single corner in every single neighborhood everybody knew his name he's really on the make Danny Meyer made a lot of moves in 2009. He was opening Shake Shacks all over the world. But I'm really into this guy who's a little bit, a little bit of a quieter tycoon. I call him. His name is Ravi Durasi. He is involved in some places that you definitely know: Mayoel, Desnuda, All in the East Village, The Bourgeois Pig, places again with serious credibility, great drinks, great vibe. And he is actually going to be opening a Cuban sandwich shop. I think maybe this week called Cien Fuegos. Five fires. And uh, thank you. <laughs> that's going to be um, the first phase of a larger project in that space. It's going to be a rum punch bar and then a Cuban restaurant. And he's just on the move. He's really, I, I find him to be, to make very smart moves in his little East Village empire, growing it slowly. But every location has something that really makes it distinct and different, as Mayuel had the tequila focus. I'm very excited to see what he does next. I think he's really someone that you need to know. Uh, can I, got, b- before I step up, yeah, before I step back up onto the decks, yep. um, you're going to say it now because we're going to check it a year from now. Uh-uh. What's the ingredient and what's the dish trend? Two-parter of 2010. Yeah, that was going to be my question too. Oh, yeah. Twins. 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 I think we are going to continue seeing a huge amount of Italian regionalization, Roman food. This has been observed, but I'm going to say it again here. Um, and I think more of like the... Uh, quinto Carto, like Ophel movement, like getting a little bit more democratized in uh, Italian restaurants around the city. Awesome. Jordana, I want to thank you for this. This was great. I I mean, maybe you can share this email with people, but she put this all into a, a beautiful email. I don't know if you have your own. You can't <laughs> do it on timeout, but your own place. But if you write Jordana, um, maybe she'll share it with you because it's really concise and it's got a lot of pl- I mean you can spend the first six months eating from all these places yeah that's and spend right. the next six months eating from the 2010 places mm-hmm. and, and then check in with me halfway through I'll give you some more check in through uh, thank you very much thank you I look forward to or we look forward to spending a number of meals and events together with you cheers and uh, we'll have you back we'll be back absolutely at least <laughs> at least in 2011 probably before then and yeah, uh, Terry is going to drop us the track. We got Yacht coming up in the next five minutes uh, with Express Mix. And we're going to turn to this food, which has just been sitting here, being ignored and possibly. So you're listening to Snacky Tunes with your host, Finger on the Pulse. This is Yacht.
guess what to do, uh oh That was uh, See a Penny, uh, Pick It Up. Jonna, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Can I call that a throwback? Has it been enough years? Yes, it's been enough years. Claire is also here, too. We're both here. We are here. Hey, oh, Claire. Hi, everybody. Hey, guys. How can, we, how can we serve you? What can we do for you? Uh, how can we make you better? Uh, well, I'd like to wish you a, a happy new year. Thank you. Oh. We'd like to return the wish. Oh. Happy new year to you. And welcome back from the um, glorious and impressive world tour. Thank you. How, yes. was, how was spreading the message? How are, how are the receivers? The receivers were willing and able. Beautiful. It was it was a real honor to to be with them around the world. Yes. Uh, when did you get back? I think we got back on December twenty first. I know we got back on December twenty first. On the the equinox, if you will. Can I say that? Mm-hmm. I can say that. Sure. Um, sure. So tour was good. We haven't seen you. Uh, yeah. the, the, for any of you who were living under a rock, we did a show called Dinner with the Band, and Yacht was our season finale. Uh, I don't know if you guys caught it because you might have been on the road, but it was our favorite episode. I'll say that. Oh, on there. That's, that's you really say that sweet. to all the bands. That's uh, really sweet, though. I mean, I, I do even s- if you do say that to everyone, that's fine. That's really sweet. Thank you. <laughs> and I, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, I know we talk a lot about food on here, but for those who don't know, Yada is vegan. You guys are vegan. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we pitched a vegan band, they were like, mm, I don't know how that's going to go because you know, cooking shows are usually about you know even vegetarianism, but. Your dish was one of the best-looking dishes as well, because those chicken and the wood mushrooms. Awesome. Yeah, those are great mushrooms. Uh, but I wanted to know, you guys went around the world as vegans, and for some yeah. cultures that might not be uh, vegetarian or even vegan-friendly, I'm curious what you ate uh, on your international tour. Highlights, lowlights, midlights? There were lots of highlights and lots of lowlights. I mean, it's kind of a, uh, a difficult journey to be a vegan abroad. Some countries are a lot easier than others, Japan, for example, is nearly impossible, whereas most European countries are totally cool. Uh, We ate amazing food in China. We did a two-week Chinese tour, and luckily we had an interpreter that spoke fluent Mandarin, and he negotiated for literally for hours with restaurateurs to get us food that was vegan because yeah, the thing with a concept there. The thing with China, with China, uh, they would be like, "No, no, no! the, The meat is free." You don't have to pay extra for it. Why, why wouldn't you want the meat? It comes in the dish. No, you're not going to like it if there's no meat. Oh, if it's you don't get the meat it. in it, it's going to be terrible. Why would you want that? We're, so. we're, that's what we're imagining they were saying, of course, because we couldn't understand anything that was yeah. going on. But we ate some awesome some hot pots, some amazing Szechuan hot pots, some cool exotic spices. We had some great eggplants. Yeah. Oh. Some it's, great tofu. What's that pepper that you love? Is it just Oh, Szechuan pepper. Do you got, are you guys coming with Szechuan pepper here in, in this uh, like, They're like peppercorn. No. Not really so a Dana's pepper. Yes. Yeah, and uh, it makes your mouth numb in this insane way, and it's part of Szechuan cooking. It's like they have numb and spicy food. That's kind of the signature of Szechuan cooking, and it's a really bizarre feeling. It, it's like the numbness makes the spicy food sweeter and less difficult to eat, but at the same time, you can hardly taste anything because your mouth is just tingling, and if you eat enough of it, you totally get high. Huh. And we brought we brought back a bag of these peppers for our friends. Oh, who really? are, they're, Uh-oh. They're, they're essentially like a band, but instead of making music, they cook, and they're called <laughs> Hot Knives. And they are awesome. Yeah, you guys should check them out. UrbanHonking.com slash Hot Knives. Done. Urban Honking, you say? Yes. Okay. That's a website that I, I built with a couple of my friends. It's oh. essentially like a, a TV network of blogs 
that we started in 2001 before blogs existed. Oh. And they invented blogs. We invented oh. blogs. That is, I, that is certified. So do you? So you're thinking that some of these people, you literally introduced them to the concept of veganism on tour? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but I don't think anybody that we met was like, "Oh, you can be vegan. I'm going to change my lifestyle." It was right. more like, "Who are these weirdos?" Yeah, I think that they maybe thought it was a singular instance of just two crazy people. <laughs> they didn't, I don't think that they thought that there was a culture around it or people that also eat like that. Yeah, they were like, "Something is wrong with these people." Yeah, one one trick that we use also is saying that we have allergies. Uh, yeah, it's cause a, it's people a great will trick. sometimes. Yeah. yeah, people will sometimes be like. Oh yeah, whatever. Let them put the milk in it anyway, or the shrimp, or something, and then and then we have like a real grounds to act scandalized. But if we eat this, we'll get sick. <laughs> how how dare you? This is my life yeah. we're talking about. So, in addition to uh, food on the road, how were the shows? Uh, and what were the uh, more memorable performances that you played in the more the more uh, exciting man. settings? Seoul, South Korea. Just going to places that we had never been before. Going to small towns in China and small towns in South Korea. Places that. Well, we, you know, we would sit back and, and kind of zoom out and imagine ourselves on a Google map. And <laughs> it was really strange to be in a place that we never thought we would ever find our human bodies. So, yes, yeah, Seoul, South Korea was especially special because it was Claire's birthday. And the kids made us a vegan cake that we passed mm. around to this audience of four or five hundred people. It was really amazing. Yeah, it was, amazing. Just crazy. it was crazy to go to these small corners of the world and because of, of the magic of the internet people knew our songs and knew the words to the songs and we were just completely overwhelmed do they i mean do they know do they know any english besides the word to your songs and other songs yeah yes oh, surprisingly okay. people around the world know how to speak english <laughs> right no <laughs> they i just feel like assholes a little bit yeah just a little bit we don't know like we I'm don't sorry. know mandarin and we don't know korean so I went to uh, Berlin a couple years ago, and I tried to order eggs, and that is not an English-friendly country, and I brought the uh, waitress to tears, because I was just trying to say the word sun and eggs for, like, sunny-side-up eggs, and that just did not translate, and I felt like a total asshole. Like, I was like, I'm just trying to get some food in here. Uh, sorry. Right. My- and how, how was- tears? Yeah. Tears? Yeah, tears. No, seriously. I have a witness. My girlfriend at the time will witness that there were tears in this woman's eye because she was so frustrated. Very emotional in Germany. Especially when it comes to food. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, to be fair, I don't think sunny side eggs exist in Germany. I mean, eggs is not an alien concept, but sunny side, that's pretty American. You think it's just an American thing? Uh, yeah, I, you know I what? think sunny I, you know side what? is American. I'm, that, now I feel like an even bigger asshole because I just assumed that that was, you know, an international, like, sunny side up egg. Who doesn't have it? Well, those? they have it in England. Well, you know, in German culture, though, it would have been proper for you to drink the tears from her eyes. That's <laughs> yes. actually part of it. Okay, so that's what I did wrong. She maybe was tearing, and then once I drank it, she would have served me breakfast. Yeah, didn't you notice there was no salt shaker on the table? Okay, yeah. moving on. Uh, how was Australia? How was the land down under? Australia is incredible. Our, we have super good friends in this amazing band called Architecture in Helsinki, which I, I hope you've heard of. Yeah, they're on Moshi Moshi. Uh, they're actually, the uh, poster, they're the poster in the living room. It was on the opposite side of where you guys were standing. It's an Architecture in Helsinki. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. They are amazing friends. They're so nice. And every time we go to Australia, they spoil us. They're kind of nicer than they should be. Hmm. Yeah, we had a really nice time with them running around going to different touristic points of interest and eating lots of awesome food. They took us on a, a tour of the largest cricket and Australian rules football stadium. Really? In the world, yeah. yeah. Which was a really big deal to them. It's called the MCG. They had never done it before. <laughs> so there was a live cricket game happening, and they like took us down to the field. And our, our friend Cameron from Architecture and Helsinki kissed the ground. <laughs> he kissed really? the field. Yeah. It was yeah, like that big a deal. Yeah. He loves Australian rules football. Where People would, out there love Australian rules football. Where yeah. would you go that would be like considered holy ground? You'd kiss the ground, you'd be so excited. Everywhere that we walk. Yeah. Okay. We kiss the ground. <laughs> yeah. All we do in this life is walk from one little tiny patch of holy ground to the next. Fantastic. Does it take a while for you to walk places? Is, is you stop and kiss the ground every step you take? Oh, we prostrate. That's uh, what you're asking. Gotcha. Definitely. So where, where will you be walking uh, in this year? Where will you be headed? We'll be walking all the way across We won't Canada. be walking. We'll be dancing. <laughs> Well, we will, be, we will be dancing across Canada, across most of the United States, across Colombia, across Mexico, across Europe, wow. and beyond. Wow. When are you coming yeah. back to uh, New York? We're yeah. coming back to New York in March. Fantastic. It's, on an, it's not announced. It's not officially announced yet, okay. so I'll wait for that to be an official announcement. Sometime in March, we will be in New York. Are you playing South by Southwest? Yes. Fantastic. You know, funny, uh, I don't know, funny, but interesting fact... Claire, I saw your second show ever with Yacht. It was at South by Southwest two years ago. Oh, at the, was it wow. Fort? It was yeah. Fort, right? And I was like, oh, hey, for all you know, Claire and I met in 2005 through our mutual friend B. 
And then I didn't see you again until uh, I was like, oh, that's Claire on stage. Hey, Claire. You're like, yeah, I joined a band. Or another band. Yep. That wasn't Weirdo Bagheera. That was a very, very early... Oh, Weirdo Bagheera. That was a very early show. A yacht is, was not really fully formed as a conceptual unit until a little bit later. Well, you know, now, we are, now we are a new version, a, a, a new, new... A better version. A new vision. A new, a new vision. Team Yacht, if you will. Uh, so we, Every six months, we sort of freak out and have to completely change the band, and that was one of the changes, and then there was another change, and now there's an even newer change. So why don't you tell us about the, uh, the mix you made? Well, Claire, do you want to talk about it? Oh, Claire made it. No? No, I made it. I made it. Oh. But Claire, Claire was there. I contributed conceptually. Spiritually, more, more so. Well, my presence. It's a, it's a mix of songs. I think that they, they sort of speak for themselves. Uh, they're songs that we like, that we listen to. We make mixes fairly often, but this one is specially catered to you and your time slot. Oh, a little, an afternoon, yeah. an afternoon delight, if you will. Yeah, it's a totally little bit of afternoon delight. delight. Wow, really? A little bit of a journey through the decades. <laughs> Uh-huh. I like it. Sex um, in the afternoon. So we This mix is entitled Sex in the Afternoon. Done. Uh so I just want to thank you guys for calling in. I know you're busy. Uh oh, hopefully thank you. S- hopefully see you soonish, sooner than later. Yes. Yeah. Uh and thanks. Enjoy the Northwest. Right now oh. we're gonna go in inside of a restaurant that where you make the pancakes yourself. Oh really? What's it called? Yeah. Shout them out. It's called Slappy Cakes. We've never been here before, so it could be terrible. So I don't know if they deserve a shout out, but it's called Slappy Cakes. All right. We're so gonna make triangle shaped pancakes. You're in Portland, Oregon. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Bye, bye. Uh, so that was just yacht calling in from Portland, Oregon. Slappy cakes. Uh, so we're gonna we're just gonna close the show with their mix. Yeah, we're uh we're, we 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 still got plates of food here, and we gotta we gotta get to them before they get cold. So I want to thank our guest Jordana Rothman for coming on and talking to us about her predictions, and thank you to Team Yacht for co- taking time to give us a call. Next week we'll be back, uh, I believe, with Anti Pop Consortium in studio. Food guest, still a mystery. <laughs> Always, uh, it's, Always it's, week to week. It's, it's, it's week to it's, week. It's uh, the Russian roulette of the food world. Big shout out to Whole Foods for uh, hooking us up, with sponsorship, and our ingredients for dinner tonight. Uh, I'm going to go live in that cheese corner on Houston and see what happens. Uh, big shout out to Jack and Z and Rectech for making us sound good, and thank you to Roberta's, who raised uh, five thousand dollars in their fundraiser for Brooklyn Grange on Friday. So thanks to everyone who came out and supported. Yeah, it's coming, and it's going to be beautiful. All right, so here you go. Uh, yacht, what does they say? Sex in the afternoon. Mix exclusively on Snacky Tunes. And in the 
Betsy Johnson bag Lips smacked up make you wanna bite my swag candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag Lips smacked up make you wanna bite my swag candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag Lips smacked up make you wanna bite my swag candy candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag Lips smacked up make you wanna bite my swag Miss pretty is back on this Jayhawk B I'm riding shotgun your hoes in the back see what a swag so me no need to compete all you looking at my pockets what they say fuck you bitch I know you heard about me Stay fly, stay clean, and you always gon' catch me in the hell's bell seat. Only fucks with the best, only roll with the illest. Chelsea and Sweetie Boss, bitches, we the realest. Hate all you want, cause I love my haters. Sick of you a trendsetter, I am the creator. Now let me grab my Louis Gucci and my Juicy. Mac red lips like I love Lucy. Diamonds on my nails, diamonds on my necklace. Got your niggas saying, damn, bro, you a bad bitch. Uh, cause I'm a first round draft pick. Candy painted nails, and I'm so damn famous. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. My diva is a female version of a hustler, of a hustler, of a of a hustler. I shine like luster, I'm sweet like honey mustard. Got you bitches nervous and scared, you in a cluster. Give me too much powder, mosquito. And Bo got it, got quite a big yeah. selection of hoes, I got not it And I can't forget my couture, juicy and my scotter And my body so covered like the Sierra Nevada's in the Excuse me if my swag is on point I'm so damn hot, I'm at my melting point And I'm long hair, long hair, don't care I walk through the room, all the boys just stare Y'all know I'm the baddest, ain't no need to compare I'll make you drop to the floor, you'll need medical care And uh, you can call me Smurf at third Hey, fuck what you heard, sit back and learn Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag. Lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy, candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag. Candy painted nails with my Betsy Johnson bag, lips smacked up, make you wanna bite my swag.
The sun is down. The sun is down. The sun is down. It's getting so dark. The sun is down. The sun is down. The sun is down. It's getting so dark. Oh, where the stars? Where the moon? The stars should shine the river. Maybe the river is even too cold for them. The sun is down. The sun is down. The sun is down. It's getting so dark. The sun is down. The sun is down. The sun is down. It's getting so dark. Throwing away the mirror in the river.、Mm. I don't need it. No, I can walk without it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time for me to、uh, go and walk. Punch out everyone you 